Hello and welcome to Principles of Macroeconomics. I'm your professor, Dr. Matthew Bradbury. We'll be using Gregory Mankiw's book, Principles of Macroeconomics. You can use any edition that you'd like, not necessarily the sixth. You can buy it used or online. You can also access an e-copy through your Applia homework platform. Today we're going to start with our first set of lectures, Principles of Economics. In this chapter, we're going to be thinking about some of the most basic and fundamental concepts in economics. What are the kinds of questions that economists address? What are the principles of how people make decisions? What are the principles of how people interact? And what are the principles of how the economy as a whole works? One of the fundamental core concepts in economics is scarcity, which is defined as the limited nature of society's resources. The idea here is that there just isn't enough to satisfy wants. Even if I loved all of my students, I couldn't give them all a penthouse in Park Avenue. Why is that? There's not enough penthouses in Park Avenue to go around. And so we have to figure out who's going to get the penthouse in Park Avenue and who's not. The allocation of goods and resources is a economic problem. The reason we face this problem is because of scarcity, the limited nature of society's resources. Economics is going to study how we deal with scarcity and achieve our goals, maximizing pleasure satisfaction, maximizing profit, maximizing well-being of a society, and it's going to come down to a lot of choice making. The study of how society manages its scarce resources is a good definition of economics. At the microeconomic level, we'll study how people decide what to buy, how much to work versus how much to, to leisure, how much to consume versus how much to save. At the firm level, we'll be trying to think about how they maximize profit, uh, how many goods should they produce, and how should they produce those goods, using labor, using machines. At the social level, we'll study how society divides up its resources. We may have competing goals between national defense, consumer goods, protecting the environment, or health care, education. How we spend the budget such that we achieve maximum social satisfaction given our limited resources. All decisions involve trade-offs. For example, if you go out and party before your midterm, you won't be studying. If you go take a nap, you won't be at the gym. If you're in this class, you won't be at work. Having more money to buy stuff requires working longer hours, less time for leisure. Protecting the environment requires other resources have to be moved from producing consumer goods. There are trade-offs in every... Society faces an important trade-off. It's kind of a ubiquitous trade-off. It shows up in a lot of different places with a lot of different faces, but fundamentally, it is the trade-off between efficiency and equality. Efficiency is a term you'll come to know very well as an economist. Efficiency is when you squeeze the most that you can from your scarce resources. Here, we're thinking about efficiency at a social level when society gets the most that it can from its scarce resources. But you might be thinking about your time and how to use it efficiently. Equality is when prosperity is distributed uniformly among society's members. It's a tendency towards more equality. Everyone gets paid the same basic salary, basic standard of living. Another way of thinking about it would be, well, if we had this class and, and, and we took the exam and I took the amount of points that were earned on the exam and I just divided them evenly among everyone in the class, well, maybe you'd all get Bs or all get Cs, right? It wouldn't matter how you performed on the exams. It would matter how the class performed and then how that was distributed. Here we're thinking in terms of equality. There's a trade-off between the two of these. Well, think about it. How hard would you work on the exam if you knew that no matter what, you'd earn the same grade as everyone else in the class? Would you strive extremely hard to get an A plus if you knew that you'd probably end up with a C plus? Yeah. And so, oftentimes, moving in the direction of equality reduces the incentives that generate efficiency. 
To achieve greater equality, we could redistribute income from wealthy to poor, but this reduces the incentive to work and produce and shrinks the size of the economic pie in general. Principle number two, the cost of something is what you give up to get it. Making decisions requires comparing costs and benefits of alternative choices. In economics, we have a special way of measuring cost. And the terminology that goes with it is opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of any item is whatever must be given up to obtain it. Opportunity cost is the relevant cost for decision making. The opportunity cost of going to college, for instance, is not just the out-of-pocket costs, tuition, books, and fees. These are the accounting costs that we might think of. But probably the largest cost, cost of going to college is foregone wages. While you're in this room, you're not working for a living. Those lost wages are a consequence of your choice to go to college. This opportunity cost is huge. If you think about it, why isn't LeBron James in college? Could he not afford the tuition? Of course he could. He makes millions and millions of dollars a year. Is he not smart enough for college? I'm sure he's smart enough for college. Well, why isn't he here then? Well, because in order to be in college, you'd have to give up very lucrative MBA contracts. The opportunity cost exceeds the benefit. And so he's postponing his college career. Principle number three, rational people think at the margin. Rational people systematically and purposefully do the best they can to achieve their objectives. Here we're echoing this idea that economists believe that individuals are rational in their pursuit of goals, systematically and purposefully choosing the best methodology available in order to achieve some end. People make decisions by evaluating costs and benefits at the marginal level. Marginal changes are incremental adjustments to an existing plan. Here in economics, we're not thinking about totals as much as we're thinking about marginals. And we're assured that thinking about measuring cost and benefit at the marginal level will lead us to maximizing totals, such as total pleasure and satisfaction, total profit, total social well-being. Let's look at an example. When a student considers whether to go to college for one more year, he compares the fees and the foregone wages, the opportunity cost, to the extra income that he or she might earn with an extra year of education. And we have to think about that income earned over a lifetime or a career. When a manager considers whether to increase output, she compares the cost of the needed labor and the materials to the extra revenue. People respond to incentives. An incentive is something that induces a person to act, i.e. the prospect of reward or punishment. Rational people respond to incentives. Let's look at some examples. Gas prices increase. Consumers buy more hybrid cars, fewer gas-guzzling SUVs. When cigarette taxes increase, teen smoking falls. Let's think of some more. When the salary of nurses goes up, more people enroll in nursing programs in college. The general idea here is that prices in the economy are the incentives that signal individuals to change their behavior, either buying fewer gas-guzzling SUVs, reducing consumption of dangerous products, or devoting their time to supplying a professional good where society needs it most. Rather than being self-sufficient, people should specialize in producing one good or service and exchange it for other goods. The idea here is that if you're trying to do everything, you're probably dividing your time between producing something that you're very good at and producing other things that you're not so good at. This kind of means that you're wasting part of your time in effectively producing goods 
that you're just not that productive with. It would make more sense for everyone to spend their time producing a specialized good for which they have very high productivity. The problem that we have then is that you're left with only one good at your disposal. I mean, suppose that you're very good at farming potatoes, and so you specialize in farming potatoes. You'll have a lot of potatoes, but you won't have much of anything else. The nice thing is that everyone else that specializes is in the same dilemma, and so this creates an opportunity for exchange. The first big boost that economies get is from productivity gains that arise from specialization according to high productivity, and then exchange. In this way, market exchange allows for the individual to specialize, which in turn allows for everyone to be using their time most effectively and overall output and wealth in an economy to grow. Countries can also benefit from trade and specialization. In one sense, we can get a better price abroad if the goods that they are producing are produced more effectively. This can raise standards of living in our country as we access cheap foreign goods. A market economy allocates resources through decentralized decisions of households and firms as they interact in markets. This is a key concept in economics. The idea is that we will organize economic activity to the greatest good of the individual and society and will do it without centralized control, centralized planning, or centralized decision making. There's a certain faith in the almost magic of individuals interacting, pursuing their best interests, which then leads to optimal market outcomes. This was the insight that was first brought up by a famous economist that you should all be well aware of, Adam Smith. He wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Out of this book, he pulled a key idea, that of the invisible hand. Each of the households and firms in the market economy act as if they were guided by an invisible hand to promote general social economic well-being. Think about it. Suppose there's a shortage of nurses. The salary for nurses will start to go up as hospitals compete for the limited resource pool of nurses. As those salaries go up, young people will look at the lucrative lifestyle and say to themselves, it's in my best interest to go become a nurse. I can do very well, have job security and high income. Individuals here being led by an invisible hand to eliminate the shortage of nurses in society. They think they're just looking after their salary. This is the idea of Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, invisible hand. Take note of the date of that publication, 1776, also the year of the American Revolution. We have this interesting idea that individualism in pursuit of your own best interests leads to social harmony. Interesting. Principle number six, the invisible hand works through the price system. The interaction of buyers and sellers determines prices. If there is a large amount of sellers and not very many buyers, the price will fall, reflecting the fact that society doesn't really want much of that good. If, on the other hand, there are many, many buyers and very few sellers, the price will rise, reflecting that there hasn't been enough supply to meet social want. Each price reflects the goods value to buyers and the cost of the produ production. Prices guide self-interested households and firms to make decisions that in many cases maximize society's well-being. Governments can sometimes improve on market outcomes. Although we think that markets generally do a good job at solving all of our economic problems, there are some cases in which they're not enough some cases in which it's important for governments to step in. Regardless of what type of economist you are, all economists agree that there's at least one fundamental way that governments must act in order for markets to work properly, and that is to enforce property rights, also known as the rule of law. In order to enforce property rights, we need legal structures, 
police, courts, and legislators. People are less inclined to work, produce, and invest or purchase if a large risk of their property being stolen. You wouldn't invest in building a business if you knew that as soon as it was profitable, it would be expropriated by some other individual, maybe even the government. In order to protect the incentive to build business and produce, we protect property rights. Principle number seven continued, governments can sometimes improve on markets. Another example of how governments can improve on markets is in the uh, instance of, of what we call market failure. Market failure is just what it sounds like. It's when the market fails to allocate society's resources efficiently. Sometimes markets left to their own devices simply don't work as the invisible hand posits that they should. Let's give you a couple examples of market failure. One example of market failure is externalities. An externality is when the production or consumption of a good affects a bystander. Think about it. Someone's smoking next to you. Maybe they enjoy it. They're willing to pay the cost and suffer the risk, and so they puff, puff, puff away. Meanwhile, you get cancer from secondhand smoke. This externality decouples the idea that the individual pursuing their own best interests would have optimal social outcomes. The idea of smoking affecting innocent bystanders reflects a negative externality. On the other hand, if you live in a neighborhood and you beautify your house and fix your lawn and, and paint over it and so on and so forth, you incur the cost of raising your own home value. But there's a positive externality as all of your neighbors see their home values rise as well. In general, negative externalities are too prevalent in society, and positive externalities are not prevalent enough. This is because the private market should make smoking more expensive and should subsidize homeowners for improving their grounds. A second example of market failure is market power. This is the idea that there's not adequate competition in the market to create efficiency. If there's just a single buyer or a single seller, then we say there's market power. One of the primary examples of this is a monopoly. That is a market in which there is a single seller. Imagine a monopoly selling milk to a group of consumers with children. That monopolist could create a shortage of milk in order to generate price increases for milk, thereby making their business more lucrative. It would be technologically feasible to produce more milk. It could be produced and still satisfy cost, but the monopolist here has exploited the idea that no one else is selling milk in order to jack up the price and exploit the consumer. Adding just a few more milk producers would allow the other milk producers to charge less than the monopolist, thereby steering market demand away from the monopolist. If the monopolist was to survive, he or she would then have to lower prices, generating gains for consumers. Public policy can be used to help in the case of externalities and help in the case of market power. Aside from using governments to improve where markets fail, there might be other cases in which governments might want to achieve goals that society views as more valuable than efficiency. For instance, governments may alter market outcomes to promote equity. If the market's distribution of economic well-being is not desirable, tax and welfare policies can change how the economic pie is divided. We saw earlier that this can come at the expense of efficiency. If the government chooses to promote equity, it's because socially there has been the decision made that the gains from equity are worth more than the losses to efficiency. This is the kind of trade-off that societies must make and a value trade-off that each society must make. Principle number eight. A country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. 
there is a huge variation in living standards across countries, also a large variation in living standards over time. Average income in rich countries is more than 10 times average income in poor countries. The U.S. standard of living today is much higher than it used to be. In fact, it's eight times larger than what it was only 100 years ago. The most important determinant of living standards is productivity. Productivity is the amount of goods and services produced per unit of labor. Productivity depends upon tools, skills, and technology available to workers. Other factors also influence productivity, things like labor unions, competition from abroad, but these have far less impact on living standards. Principle number nine. Prices rise when governments print too much money. Inflation is an increase in the general level of prices. You might see the cost of rent go up, but maybe milk and health care goes down. We're thinking about the average level of prices overall. In the long run, inflation is almost always caused by excessive growth in the quantity of money. Growth in the quantity of money generates inflation and means that the dollar buys fewer and fewer goods and services. Inflation causes the value of money to fall. The faster a government creates money, the greater the inflation rate. A strong connection between the rate of monetary growth and the rate of price increases. Societies face a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. In the short run, which we estimate to be between one and two years, Many economic policies can push inflation and unemployment in opposite directions. What that means is we might see economic stimulus, either fiscal or monetary, generating some inflationary trends, but coming with the benefit of improving employment. This will be an effect that occurs only in the short run. Other factors can make this trade-off more or less favorable, but the trade-off is always present. This has been Chapter 1 of Gregory Mankiw's Principles of Macroeconomics. Let's take a rundown of what we've done thus far. The principles of decision-making are people face trade-offs. The cost of any action is measured in terms of foregone opportunities. That was our concept of opportunity cost. Rational people make decisions by comparing marginal cost and marginal benefits. People respond to incentives. In the economy, those incentives are prices. The principles of interaction among people are that trade can be mutually beneficial. Markets are usually a good way of coordinating trade. Governments can potentially improve market outcomes if there is market failure or if the market outcome is undesirable in terms of being inequitable. Lastly, the principles of the economy and how it works as a whole are that productivity, the amount of output per worker hour, is the ultimate long-run source of raising material well-being. Money growth is the ultimate source of inflationary trends which erode the value of money. Society faces a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Our next chapter will deal with the way economists think. Have a nice day.